Well, good morning. I also bring my greetings to those of you that are visiting today. Welcome to the campus. We're always honored to have you here. It is a privilege to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Charles Swindoll, Chancellor Emeritus of Dallas Theological Seminary and Senior Pastor Teacher of Stonebriar Community Church in Frisco, Texas. We are delighted to always have him on campus many times throughout the year and throughout the semester. Dr. Chuck Swindoll, or simply known as Chuck, again serves as our Chancellor Emeritus. His name is probably familiar to many Christians around the world. In fact, I would guess that some of you based your decision to attend this very seminary because of his association and affection for it. He served DTS from 1994 to 2001 as the fourth president and is known by millions around the world for his practical application of the Bible to everyday living. He serves DTS as Chancellor Emeritus, as I've said, and also again as the senior pastor teacher of Stonebriar Community Church. He and his wife Cynthia reside here in the Metroplex, and a big priority for them is spending much of their time with their four grown children and their ten grandchildren and their seven great-grandchildren. So it's always an honor to have Dr. Swindoll with us, and so would you please join me in welcoming Chuck today. When the chaplain mentioned uh, Michael's voice, it reminded me of the uh, conference I did on one occasion with uh, Lloyd Ogilvy, the late uh, Lloyd Ogilvy, who is now with the Lord. We were at Mount Hermon together, a conference center out in Northern California. And if you've ever heard the voice of Lloyd Ogilvy, <laughs> like a the sound of many waters, I mean, this angelic, deep voice. I got up and felt like Mickey Mouse when it was my turn. <laughs> Some voices are just made for a pulpit. So you'll put up with mine since it was not made for a pulpit, but I've adapted to it. I was shocked when I sat where you're sitting in Chafer Chapel back in the summer or the really the early fall of 1959, I was a first year student uh, sitting not knowing what to expect from the chapel speaker. I was really in for a surprise. I think it was either his opening line or the major line of his message when he said, when God wants to do an impossible task, he takes an impossible person and crushes him. That put a, a chill down my back. Even though I just recently come out of a tour of duty in the Marine Corps, even though I was at that time approaching my mid-twenties, I had not been crushed. Cynthia and I were happily married. Uh, at that time, we had no children, though four would come along in the years to, to come. Uh, we, we, had, we had known the love of one another and of so many friends. Our arrival at the school was an answer to prayer and my even having a place and a desk at the school was uh, just an act of God for which I, to this day, do not cease to give thanks, but crushed. I wondered what that meant. In fact, I had that, that statement in mind when I selected the hymn we just sang. Maybe its words are so familiar, you have forgotten what Isaac Watts wrote. Am I a soldier of the cross? 
a follower of the Lamb? Shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? And get this line, must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the flood? Is this vile world a friend to grace to help me on to God? Those are powerful words and unpopular in our self-serving era where it's all about me, mine, myself, my comfort, my desires, my will, my plans, when in fact ministry is none of the above. We are not called with me in mind. He is the reason for our calling. His plan is the plan to follow. And it is often surprising, which ties in with the statement that the Lord breaks us down, as that speaker put it, crushes us to carry out his will through us. During the more than 60, almost 60 years that I've followed that time I, uh, of, of ministry, I have come to know something of the crushing though not nearly as much as many of my brothers and sisters, but I know of no one greatly used of God who has not also been wounded, hurt, bruised, broken, lacerated, crushed. It's an essential part of his plan I call it the crucible that God puts us through. And you who have not yet entered into ministry can only imagine. And you may even wonder if that's going to happen in your life. And I will tell you it will. Though I cannot tell you how or when, it will He will break you. He will shape you into the image of his son, whatever that may take. And the crushing will often be very, very difficult to bear. This ties in with my theme during this academic year. I want want to speak on the pros and cons of ministry. During this fall semester, I want to talk about what makes the ministry so challenging. And then the spring semester, I want to address what makes it so fulfilling. Lest we think it is all crushing. It certainly is not. But some of it is. And it's that part that becomes disillusioning because we didn't expect it to happen. Even though people tell us, as I'm telling you today, we could never guess how it will impact us. I've already talked about two areas that make the ministry challenging. On one occasion, when I was here earlier this semester, I talked about the people who are around us, who are difficult people to deal with. They cause a great deal of challenge for us when we serve our Savior. Difficult people. And then the next time I was here this fall, I talked about 
the human characteristics we bring into ministry, especially those of fleshly, carnal characteristics that we don't leave behind. We're not rid of them when we enter the halls of learning or the ranks of ministry. You carry yourself with you. Your bad habits here or bad habits then, later on. Your ugly side remains your ugly side. And it doesn't go away just because you have earned a degree at a seminary or because people refer to you as doctor this or reverend that. You, you're still who you are and sometimes it'll embarrass you. It'll often disappoint you how it comes out. We, we simply cannot rid ourselves of the old nature. It's with us until we breathe our last and we are in that glorified state where we no longer have that nature to hound us and haunt us. And so today, I want to talk about the unexpected things that happen to us. Now get this, they are rarely our fault. They happen to us. And they impact us deeply. As I said earlier, they hurt us. They can crush us. And unless we realize they are all for our good and for our God's glory, we'll resent them. We'll even resist them. We may even try to deny them. But there they are nevertheless. Before I turn to the scriptures and, and uh, illustrate these things from God's word, let me uh, turn first to a very interesting commencement speech. It's delivered by, well, an unusual source. First of all, the audience is a group of ninth grade graduates. Rather modest gathering. And the um, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court is the, is the commencement speaker, John Roberts. Now, he's the commencement speaker because one of the ninth grade graduates is his son. That's how that happened. But I'm sure not even his son expected his daddy to talk on what he spoke on because commencement speakers usually tell you what you long to hear, how great you are, how marvelous your accomplishment is, how good things will be and great wishes for you. <laughs> Just all the great things that pour forth from a commencement speaker. Not with John Roberts, not that day. He called his speech, I wish you bad luck. <laughs> but he did so with good intentions. I'll cut to the chase and not give you all of his speech. But listen to his wishes for the graduates and be sure you hear all of them, not only the event, but what follows, because that's where the lesson is. That's where the message is. He told his audience, from time to time, in the years to come, I hope you will be treated unfairly. So that you will come to know the value of justice. Second, I hope that you will 
suffer betrayal from someone you trusted because that will teach you the importance of loyalty. His unusual wishes went on. So he adds, sorry to say this to you, but I, I hope you will be lonely from time to time so that you never take your friends for granted. And he added, and when you lose, as you will from time to time, I hope every now and then your opponent will gloat over your failure. It's a way for you to understand the importance of sportsmanship. And I hope you'll be ignored so that you know the importance of, of listening to others. I will hope, and, and I hope you will have just enough pain to learn compassion. Whether I wish these things or not, adds Justice Roberts, whether I wish these things or not, they're going to happen. And whether you benefit from them or not will depend on your ability to see the message in your misfortune. That's the title of my talk today. Don't miss the messages in your misfortune. There are many of them you have yet to learn You've not learned them because you've not suffered the crushings of those misfortunes, and they will crush you. They will break you down. They will cause you to wonder, should you be doing what you're doing? Should you keep on doing it? Should you ever trust anyone else when a really good friend betrays you? Should you ever try to select another elder when an elder you have endured has made your life miserable for years? You're going to be crushed. So don't miss the messages. That's my point. Now, the scriptures. 2 Corinthians chapter... Four verses 8 and 9 give us sort of a, well, difficult job description. We are afflicted in every way. We are perplexed. The passage goes on to say it means not knowing which way to turn. Several render this in paraphrases, we are at wit's end. You'll be there. You'll be there. We are afflicted. We are at wit's end. Third, we are persecuted. And fourth, we are struck down, knocked down. Now, each of them has a contrast, the benefit the message and the misfortune I'll not get into from this passage. The point is, you will be pressed on every side. You will be bewildered. You will be at a loss to explain why this happened. And you'll be knocked flat down, wondering if you'll ever get back up. Yes, yes. Yes, that will happen. Right now, it doesn't seem possible. I understand that. That's where I was in the, in the, in the fall of 1959. I, I thought, well, that, he must be talking to some of these guys around me because uh, crushing is not in, uh, that, that's really not, not part of my MO. I made it through the Marines. I'd make it through anything. 
The stuff I've had in ministry would make the Marines look like, a, I don't know, knitting daisy chains in the, <laughs> in, in, in the scouts. You, you ain't seen nothing yet till you enter the ranks of ministry. And I'm here to warn you. I'm here to help you enter there, those ranks, realistically. So many times in your ministry, you'll ask, I wonder what could happen next. And here's the really confusing part. What's happened isn't your fault. <laughs> so you'll ask, what, what did I do to deserve this? You really did nothing. It's happening to you. Like a really good friend of mine I had lunch with. Let's see, it was, I think, early this week. He's involved with us at Insight for Living. While engaged in ministry, he gets a phone call from home. His wife is in ER. She can't see very well out of one eye. She was able to get to ER, and she doesn't know what the problem is. And they're calling to let him know he needs to come home quickly. After testing, they found a, a tumor in her brain about the size of a tennis ball. Just stop right there. Just stop right there. This is the woman he loves, the mother of their three children, Godly couple, finest couple you'd ever want to meet. Going blind in one eye from a tumor, and their words were, it's got to be taken out. It wound up being a cut from here down to here. And they got it all, but they didn't know the details of this. I told Scott when I heard the story again from him, I said, you know, all of us had our hearts go out to your wife, but I got to tell you, I identified with you. How that must have felt. And by the way, the ministry goes right on. I forgot to mention that. It just goes right on. Sunday comes next Sunday. Sound like Yogi Berra here. Next Sunday, Sunday happens. Yeah. <laughs> And next Sunday, and the following Sunday, as the tumor has been growing, as surgery has happened, as the neurosurgeon who is so qualified, he's known as the artist, excises the tumor, it's benign. Is there a better word to use ever in life than benign? And as he puts it, Scott said, you can't even see where she was cut. And she is recovering. But during that period of time, who knew? Could have been you. Could have been your, your spouse or mine. Things happen to us and they crush us. And we're reading the Bible we're in a whole new light. Suddenly, it's talking to us about our lives. So when we read words like verses 8 and 9, we're not reading about Paul living through this, though it's true. We're, le we're reading our autobiography. Our biography. Our knowledge is limited to bits and pieces. We can't figure out. The work of the ministry goes on. So what do you do? Well, I'm going to turn to a verse of scripture you have memorized. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm going to um, use it on purpose so that you... We'll have a whole new appreciation for it, I hope. 
I'm referring to Romans 8, what verse? Right, 28. And we know that all things work together for the good to them who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Could you just give those words out? You just preach those words? Just write those words? But I want you to see them deeply and how they apply. By the way, we need to see the context. Look at the context. Maybe you've never checked it before. Romans 8, 28 is preceded by verse 24. Which includes the words we do not see. And verse 20 or 25. No, it's 24. What's the matter with me? It's verse 25. And then verse 26, we do not know. We do not see. We do not know. We do not see what's coming. We do not know how to pray as we should. We don't. How does Scott pray for his wife? How, how does the 17-year-old pray for their mother? How do you, facing Sunday service, go on? You don't see with any sense of perspective, and you don't know how to pray. In fact, it is so difficult. The Spirit of God prays for you with groanings that cannot be uttered. Isn't that an amazing way to put it? Since we don't see, and since we can't know, then there's only one place to look, and that's up, and there's only one to turn to, and that's the one who sees and knows. And may I add that his ways are not our ways, neither are our thoughts, his thoughts. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are better than our ways. In light of that, we look to him with some sense of confidence, and that's where verse 28 plays its vital role. First, we know. Look at that. This is a promise that's to be claimed and never ignored we know this. We don't hope this is true. We don't guess this is true. We don't just think this is true. We know it. We know it. Everything in this verse starts with something we know. We have absolutely unshakable faith in the words that are going to follow. We know this is true. What's true? God causes. Not because he's cruel, but because he's wise. He either makes it happen or permits it to happen. But he's behind it. He okays it. The plan and the project, these are God's, not ours. It's all in his hands. He is fulfilling his will in his time and in his way. In all this mess and misery, he is at work. His plan is relentlessly unfolding. He's causing his plan that he doesn't stop to explain to you. To you, it's a storm. George Herbert wrote on one occasion, storms are the triumph of his art. He specializes in storms. Nahum 1.7 speaks of, he has his way in the whirlwind and the storms and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He causes these things. He permits these things. He okays these things. They have his approval.
What is it he causes? All things to work together for good. For his glory, for our good. So I remind myself when such things occur, this is for your glory, Lord, and for my good. Remind me of that. Drill that home in my brain. Remind me of it. These are profound words, and they have gaps, my gaps of ignorance in them. Romans eleven thirty three. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Get this. How unsearchable are his judgments. How unfathomable are his ways. Unsearchable, unfathomable. All for his glory and for our good because they are according to his purpose. You enter ministry, you enter into his plan and purpose for your life. And God immediately goes to work shaping you into the image of his son. Uh, it isn't an easy shaping. It in includes, as I've said, painful, unexpected times when we think we can't go on. And so in light of that, just as the justice, chief justice brought a message to uh, that group of graduates, I want to give you five wishes that I have for you along the same line as John Roberts gave at that little commencement address. First, I hope you will not know early success. Let me repeat that. I hope you will not know early success in your ministry. Rather, I hope you will encounter difficulties that will drive you to your knees. That will teach you the value of vulnerability and it will enable you to keep success from ever going to your head. Early success can make people awfully proud. I hope you are beginning to show a few gray hairs before you begin to taste any measure of success in ministry. I hope it comes later on. Second, I hope you will experience obscurity and anonymity after you leave these halls of learning. Especially if you are greatly gifted and intellectually bright. The result will be great lessons in humility. keeping you surprised that God would be pleased to use you in the years to come. May that always be a surprise to you. I hope you will experience obscurity and anonymity. Remember Paul, shortly after he gained his eyesight back, following his conversion, he went away to Arabia for years. We never know what he did there. No one knows. Obscure. Anonymous. 
probably for many people, forgotten. That was where the revelation of God's plan for his life and for the future, which included, by the way, the thorn in the flesh, whatever that was. It was severe. It was painful. The Greek term thorn means a sharp stake. So whatever it was, it was physically painful. And he lived with it till he died. Easy to forget that. It helped him become the man he was as he was crushed by the thorn. Third, I hope you will fail because you relied on your own flesh to reach certain personal goals. Those failures will be a healthy part of your personal growth toward maturity. You will learn far more from your failures than you will ever learn from your great accomplishments. Fourth, I hope you will be forced to deal with a difficult elder <laughs> or a fellow staff member who gives you fits. Even one who, like Demas, who forsakes you. I could keep you busy through for the rest of the morning telling you stories from my own life where I really relied on certain individuals only to find out they had deceived me. One man carried on a sexual encounter with other women while serving on the staff quite effectively until he was found out. Speaking of that, I know of another individual now gone who at the time was a very effective Bible teacher, taught a large adult fellowship class at a church, was the chair of a Bible department at a fine Bible college while carrying on with one of his students sexually. I got a call in the middle of the night from a detective who said he had to meet with me. It was pouring down rain. I said, I... I'm not coming out tonight. He said, yeah, you will. You, you, you need to be meeting with me because if you don't, and he named the man, he'll be dead in less than two days. The husband of this woman that he's having the affair with already has a hit man, and he'll be dead. He's going to kill him. Well, I went out that rainy night. <laughs> And we had quite a conversation the next day. I confronted the man. He denied it. They usually do. And then I said, you see this fellow sitting at the end of the room over there? We were in an empty room except for the detective with a brown envelope. I said, before you lie any further, see this man over there? Yep. See that envelope? Yep. In it are photographs of you with her in bed. You want to look at the photographs with me? No, I don't. You need to know something. Tomorrow you'll be dead if you don't break this off. It's a man I trusted. It's a man hundreds of people believed in. Living a lie. I hope you'll know that experience. And it'll break your heart It'll disillusion you. You'll probably lose your way home that day wondering how in the world could this have happened right under my eyes. You're crushed. You're broken. You realize the heart of man is desperately wicked. You'll learn to hold people accountable 
you'll learn not to be so gullible. You'll take your time in selecting leadership. You'll be very, very cautious about the choice of elders. You won't just get a couple of good friends, your buddies, as you form the church. Please don't. You need qualified, godly, capable men to serve in that capacity. I hope you'll be forced to deal with difficult people. Fifth, I hope you will be hindered by unexpected obstacles that will keep you from reaching your goals in your ministry so that you will discover what God's goals are. By the way, this has a great ending, even though right now you feel like taking your life. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I want to tell you that um, God knows what he's doing. He's not wiping you out. He's just breaking your heart. He's just interfering with your will. He's just cutting your legs out from under you so you quit walking in your own strength. Paul really wanted to go to Rome. He really wanted to make the gospel known to the seat of power. And he stated that. This was his plan, his hope. He never dreamed how he would get there. He would wind up being uh, under house arrest of all things. He couldn't even move out of that house, chained to another Praetorian guard member. And he realized while he was there, those two years, hey, this is a captive audience. <laughs> so he led him to Christ. And tomorrow he led the next one to Christ. And before long, he led a whole barracks full of them to Christ. And the whole Praetorian guard talked about Christ. And guess who they talked to? Well, they had access to the emperor himself. He never dreamed it would come through an imprisonment. And he said, it's fallen out to me for the greater expanse of the gospel. He, that's a strange evangelistic plan. Don't miss the message, okay? Don't get hung up in the, in the, in the misfortune. It, it'll be dreadful. There'll be some that, that are miserable. Don't forget you were warned. Don't forget you heard it. Don't forget it may be your spouse. It may be your elder. It may be in your community where the flood happens. It may be into your home the thief breaks. It may be one of your children. It'll crush you. Don't miss the message. There's a great passage in Deuteronomy 8.2. You shall remember all the way the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness Get this, to humble you, to test you, to show what was in your heart, whether you'd keep his word or not. Forty years to humble you, to put you through the tests, to reveal to you what's in your heart. God knows what's in your heart. You need to see it. And then you will turn to him and you'll give him praise for walls that crumble down by just walking around them. You'll give him praise for being able to conquer the strong enemy, the Canaanites. As you move into homes you didn't build and eat from trees you didn't plant and drink from cisterns you didn't dig. 
and blessings will come and you'll go, Lord God, you get all the glory for this. Thank you for the years, the years when you broke me down and cut me down to size. Thank you. John Oxenham once wrote these fine words. He writes in characters too grand for our short sight to understand. We catch but broken strokes and try to fathom all the mystery of withered hopes of death, of life. The endless war, the useless strife, but there, with larger, clearer sight, we shall see his way was right. There's a great hymn in our hymnals that unfortunately most churches don't sing anymore. Written by a man who lost four daughters at sea. They were traveling with their mother to get to England. Having left Chicago, they went to New York and then set sail. And of all things, there was a collision at sea and their ship sank. The mother lived through it and sent a wire back that said to the dad, her husband, saved alone. Shortly thereafter, the dad, mourning the death of his precious girls, went to sea and took a ship across to be with his wife. When he came to what was figured to be this area where that ship had sunk, he stood on the deck of that ship and wept and later wrote, when peace like a river attends my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, whatever my lot, Thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. Horatio Spafford did not miss the message. Though he lost all four of his daughters. Let's pray. Father, I have no idea what you're saying to different ones in this meeting. Uh, I, I, I don't know most of these men and women. But I do know this. I know you. And I've trusted you throughout my ministry, even when I didn't know which way to turn. Thank you for never leaving me in the lurch. Thank you for teaching life's hardest lessons when I couldn't even explain why they had happened. We do pause now, asking you to get us ready for whatever you have for us, knowing that when you want to do an impossible task, you take an impossible person and you crush him. May you find it well with our soul following the crushing. In Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen.